Good morning. You're listening to WPVM LP in Asheville, North Carolina, 1037 on the dial and globally at WPVMFM.org and on our new apps available at iTunes or Google Play. And we're on Alexa. You can listen to Ash to WPVM by telling Alexa to tune in Asheville Radio or the voice of Asheville. And we have, we are honored to have Eric Gash in today for an interview. Thank you so much, Mr. Gash, for coming in. And thank you so much for throwing your hat in the ring in this incredibly important race. Well, thank you so much for having me, Davine. As we were talking, uh, Davine Dow, that's an awesome name for radio. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's uh, I count it a privilege and an honor, uh, you know, to be on your show. And I look forward to our discussion today. Yeah, people have asked me, is that my real name? And yes, <laughs> yes, it is. So, so um, people describe you as a hometown hero. You played linebacker, linebacker at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Yes. You have a great background. You've been a math teacher, which I'm in awe of because <laughs> math is not my strong suit. Uh, you've been an assistant principal at Hendersonville High School, yes. mm -hmm. and most recently as the principal of your childhood alma mater, Bruce Drysdale Elementary, and that must be a real trip. Oh, it was it was an honor. It was, uh, you know, Bruce Rosdell uh, opened in January of 1960, and I took over as principal in January of 2020. So 60 years later, I walked through the halls uh, as the principal of my old elementary school, and that was quite a treat. That's that's a great story. So, and you're also the lead pastor of Speak Life Community Church. You're a volunteer yes. chaplain with the Hendersonville City Police Department. And you serve on the board for the Henderson County Community Foundation. Yes, as well as uh, I sit on uh, the board of the Juvenile Crime Prevention Council, uh, the newly formed Diversity and Equity Inclusion Advisory Council uh, by the city as well. Great. So uh, just a little quote here that I found about you uh, in regards to why you made your decision to run. The August 2020 Mountain Express story on religious leaders becoming involved in social justice, you're quoted as saying that you didn't consider yourself an activist, but that the killing of George Floyd opened your eyes. You say, I'm almost ashamed to say I've never spoken at a protest rally. I've never marched, nothing. Being black in America, we've learned to overlook things, look past things and give folks the benefit of doubt. Yeah, um, I, I remember that article uh, when it came out. And, you know, I look at the uh, the George Floyd incident as a, kind of a watershed moment in my life and in the in the history of our country. Um, I look at it. Um, I call it my Emmett Till moment, you know, for those uh, who are civil rights. Mm -hmm. I remember that back. Uh, Emmett Till uh, was a young man who was from Chicago, visited the Deep South, his family there and was killed uh, off of false accusations. And his mom said, I want you to bury him with an open casket or, you know, have the funeral with an open casket so that the world can see what they did to my baby. Uh, and that sparked the civil rights movement. Uh, and it, it changed something uh, in the heart of our nation. Uh, and it brought awareness to certain things, uh, you know, that was going on uh, to uh, African-Americans here uh, in America. And, you know, I look at George Floyd as, uh, you know, that was an egregious event that happened uh, and the world saw uh, as, as he, his life slowly ebbed away and something shifted in my spirit. And I said, we are better than this. We have to be better than this. And so, uh, yeah, I was asked to speak at that rally. Um, and in, in the wake of all of that, and I'm sure we'll get into it, you know, we started having community conversations with our law enforcement. I invited the heads of law enforcement into our church. And we had uh, uh, about 60 folks there. Of course, it was in COVID. So we had, you know, the social distance uh, precautions in place. And it was simply um, with our law enforcement, this is who we are as a community. Community, here's our uh, chiefs in law enforcement. Let's, let's talk, let's have a conversation so that what happened nationally, uh, we can protect our communities from. So you're, you're uh, as a volunteer with the Hendersonville <coughs> Police Department, that does give you an inside kind of track to know a little bit about the local police department more intimately. 
And so because of seeing George Floyd die with the knee on the neck, uh, the metaphor of the knee on the neck is universal, unfortunately, for Black people and other minorities. So how have how has the George Floyd incident uh, affected how you relate with the police department in Hendersonville? Well, it's uh, it, it caused me, you know, f- for a while uh, before I became um, a volunteer chaplain, I was interested and, and wanted to, to kind of reach out, just didn't quite have the avenue or, or know the avenue what to do. Didn't, you know, the timing was was a little bit off as a, uh, I was also an athletic director at Hendersonville High School. And so I got to know a lot of the uh, the police department. They'd come and cover our football games, basketball games and soccer games. They just stopped by sometimes. And so I knew a lot of those individuals and I wanted to get involved. I'm also a prison ministry volunteer uh, where we uh, back before COVID, you know, we could go in and, and hold Bible studies with, uh, with the inmates there and, and just talk to them and let them know that they're still loved, even though, uh, you know, they got caught up in whatever the decision was, whatever happened. They just they need to know that they're still loved. And I saw it as an opportunity um, to be purposeful and be intentional about reaching out. And so at the uh, I spoke with the then uh, police chief, uh, Chief Blake, who's now uh, in Buncombe County. Um, and, and we had a conversation uh, at, at my school. And uh, he says, uh, and I said, I started inquiring about the chaplaincy program. He said, I can make that happen. <laughs> and uh, next thing you know, um, you know, I got my credentials and, and was able to go in and, and talk with the, the officers, pray with them, do ride alongs. Uh, and it was a great look uh, to see kind of behind the veil of law enforcement and give them an opportunity uh, to see behind the veil of, uh, of Black America here, uh, you know, in, in our community. And so um, I took it as an opportunity to bridge the gap and the divide and uh, let them know, you know, social change starts um, or moves at the speed of trust and trust moves at the speed of relationships. And we have to start building these relationships and not be uh, afraid to be intentional about reaching out to folks. Well, thank you for that. That's uh, certainly important work. And so let's start off with um, a uh, kind of a controversy that happened. Your uh, past voting history, when we looked into it, you voted Republican from 2012 to 2018, and then you switched to Democrat in, in 2020. Uh, tell the listeners and the viewers why, why that, why that uh, looks like that. <laughs> well, it looks like that because <laughs> that's what I did. Um, see, I was, uh, uh, and, and when I saw that on the, uh, on the, the website there on the candidate matrix, I was a bit taken aback um, because I was not registered Republican. I've been registered independent uh, up until I, I registered for Democrat, mm-hmm. um, you know, back early, earlier this year. And, uh, you know, I, I was I was always I've always been in the middle, you know, as an independent. I'm going to look in for folks who I feel have the best interest of of, of Western North Carolina. Um, you know, I know a lot of folks uh, being, you know, from here, fifth generation from here. My mom has been involved in our community <laughs> forever. Uh, my, my family has. Um, and so I know a lot of folks, my, my neighbors are Democrats and Republicans and, and we all, you know, work together. Um, and I've always looked at, okay, who do I feel best um, you know, being in a blood red district, keep that in mind, <laughs> right? Being that we're surrounded by red, um, who do I feel, you know, represents closest to what my values are? Um, and sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm voting for folks that, that I know. Um, and uh, so I, I don't know if it's that much of a controversy. You know, there's close to 200,000 people that are registered independent here in our district. Um, and the majority of folks are you know, kind of in the middle. And, you know, I'm not going to be controlled by either extreme. I'm going to vote, you know, my conscience and, and for the person who I feel is going to best represent um, my community here. Well, there are, are, is a growing number of unaffiliated in our region, for sure. I myself have been unaffiliated since I moved here and registered to vote. So I understand that. And I did want to give you a chance to uh, go deeper into that instead of just the numbers on on the page Mm -hmm. 
I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, well I do appreciate that, and thanks for the opportunity. Um, sure. But yeah, it was, it was a, it's a little misleading for for someone to say that you know I was Republican. No, I'm I'm always been registered yeah. independent. You know. But, yeah. Uh, well, for clarity, that for clarity, that was just the voting history, not necessarily sure. saying that that uh, you were you were you were of a, one party or the other. Sure. So let's move to healthcare, and it certainly is a very important issue. I've gone through uh, the issues that you have on your website, which the, the ticker says uh, WPB or uh, HTTP ericgash.com. So you say, I believe we should create a public option system ensuring that millions more Americans have access to affordable care. I will also defend policies that protect a woman's right to make her own medical health and reproductive decisions. So yes. that kind of clarifies that you actually are not anti pro that that you're more pro choice than you are uh, the term pro life. Sure, sure. And, and, and looking at that, you know, it's, it's a privacy issue uh, between a woman, her family, and their health care provider. Um, you know, it's, it's personal and personal decisions shouldn't be made by the government. <laughs> That's, uh, uh, you know, and I'll defend a woman's right to make her own medical uh, health and, and reproductive decisions because it's a privacy issue. Um, and I was uh, recently at a, um, um, a back to school fest here in Hendersonville. And I had two ladies come up to me from, you know, from one of the local churches. And they said, uh, uh, well, Eric, I hear that you're running for Congress but you're running for the wrong party, <laughs> right? And I said, well, let's talk about that. Why, why would you say that? And they said, I'll give you three reasons, abortion, abortion, abortion. And I said, and I said, with all due respect, I said, if you ask a hundred registered Democrats or a hundred people, period, ask them if they're pro-life or pro-death, what do you think they're gonna say? And they just kind of looked. I said, they're gonna be pro-life. Nobody's pro-death. Right. I said, you know, there, there are situations that happen. I said, you know, um, you know, nieces, nephews may have daughters. I said that the Lord forbid a situation occurs to where a decision like that has to be made. I said, but if it is, who would you want making that decision? Would you and your family want to go behind closed doors with your health care provider and make that decision? Or would you want somebody else telling you what to do? And they just kind of looked at me with a quisitive look. And I said, exactly. I said, that's it. It's about you having the privacy to make your own decision. And government shouldn't be making that decision, you know. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm about, uh, you know, whole life. And the Build Back Better plan is uh, putting pr provisions in the reconciliation bill uh, for universal pre-K, living wages. And it deals with these issues um, that, you know, folks find themselves in. And so it's about lifting folks up and uh, it's about whole life and making sure that we see the whole person uh, from, you know, cradle to the grave, uh, you know, from the womb to the tomb. You've heard all the sayings. And, and so that's what uh, the Democratic Party stands for, is about helping folks, um, taking care of the least of these. Well, that's interesting that you said that. Uh, you know, my understanding of human evolution is compassion being the highest level that humans can reach. And it certainly does appear that the Democrats are much more a party of compassion. Um, uh, and healthcare is part of accessibility to healthcare is part of that compassion for people to help them out in their time of need. Um, and it's unfortunate that healthcare has become almost a class issue, wherein uh, if you have access to quality healthcare, you're actually, I think at this point, considered upper tier in, in uh, the, uh, just your uh, ability to have a quality of life. And that's, yeah. that's, that's not, um, <laughs> it shouldn't be that way. No, not, not, uh, not in the United States of America, the greatest country on earth. <laughs> it should not be. Um, and it's, and it's how we take care of the least of these, 
uh, you know, there are folks who, who have situations, you know, let, let's even look at our veterans, you know, and uh, uh, just the homelessness, uh, you know, with our veterans. We need to take better care of our veterans. We need to uh, take better care of those who, who need a, a hand up, not a hand out. Right. Um, and, and that's what this is, is about taking care of our neighbor. You know, part of uh, our mountain values is is relying on each other and, and treating your neighbor as yourself. Uh, you know, your word is your bond. Uh, a handshake is as good as a written contract. And we need to start taking care of each other and looking out for the least of these. That's what, um, you know, my faith calls me to do uh, is to <laughs> take care of the least of these. And that's why, um, you know, I've lived the way I've lived. My mom raised me that way. I'm raised by a single mom in an abusive uh, household. My father was an alcoholic. Um, and, you know, we, we struggled behind closed doors. It, it was tough sometimes, a lot of times. Um, but my mom is a pillar of strength and she's the strongest person that I know. And I was fortunate enough to have her uh, with me at the Haywood County um, Candidate Showcase. And I highlighted my mom. She's, you know, worked almost 30 years at GE. Uh, she's now working in a memory care facility. But I learned my strength and resilience and having a servant's heart and a servant's attitude directly from her because she exemplified to me what it means to serve others and put their needs above your own. And that certainly is acted out in your profession, both involved with the schools and in, in your ministry, for sure. Yeah. And, you know, my understanding of what Jesus had to say in the basic message was, like you just uh, mentioned, is that uh, you give people a handout, not necessarily a handout. Yeah, and, and, and speak to their humanity. We have to give folks the benefit of their humanity. Um, you know, it doesn't matter what a political view, uh, view is uh, or, or what your political views are, uh, what your skin color is, where you live, who you love, what you think about. It's about giving folks the benefit of their humanity and treating them with that respect. And that's another, you know, mountain value is treating people with respect. And, uh, and we have to get back to that. Um, you know, far too long. And we see in our politics and the political climate um, that everybody's in it for themselves. You know, get all you can, can all you get, sit on your own can and kick everybody else's can over. <laughs> it's kind of the philosophy as opposed to saying, hey, we need to take care of each other. Yes. So on the jobs and economy, uh, you say we need to ensure that North Carolina 11 remains a peace, a place that both business and worker friendly so that our local economy can continue to thrive without leaving anyone behind. And for black people uh, or for the black community, the uh, kind of the going uh, uh, sense for black uh, people in Asheville is that they have to sacrifice to stay here. Whereas they could go to Atlanta or other larger cities and they're not held back like they are necessarily in, in our own community. And, and uh, I'm sure that you have seen this happen in your area too, that in order to stay, you have to sacrifice and settle for less. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and one of the things uh, about living in the most beautiful place on earth <laughs> right yeah. here in West North Carolina and um, is, is everybody wants to live here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a, a very desirous place to be. Um, and we see, uh, I was talking to a realtor a couple of weeks ago because I'm looking, you know, I have three grown kids. Uh, both of my boys have graduated college, one from NC State and one from Western Carolina. And our daughter uh, is a junior at uh, North Carolina A&T. But we're trying to find somewhere because right now they're home. You know, COVID kind of shut things down. They've been at home for a while and they're bigger than me. I stand at 6'3", 230 pounds and one's 6'4", and one's 6'6". Wow. <laughs> you know, so, so they tower over me, but they still know who daddy is, right? Uh, but we're trying to find, you know, just a place for them to go and live and, and buy a house. And um, a realtor was telling me that there were some houses built out uh, in Mills River out here in Henderson County for the workers of the uh, Raytheon plant, uh, you know, that's going to be mm -hmm. uh, coming here. And they said that the, uh, the cost was set at about uh, 250 to 300,000. And they said folks were coming in and paying double that amount for those very same houses. And so if you're a seller, you're thinking I can double my, my cost right here. And so, but that's driving up real estate prices and affordable and workforce housing is a minimal. Um, I know some things that we're doing here in Henderson County uh, that the city council is, you know, rezoning some areas uh, to put, you know, affordable and workforce housing 
and we have to make sure that people can live here uh, and afford to live here with uh, a living wage. You know, I'm, I've said this before. Um, my, uh, you know, my friends call me Big E, and I'm gonna talk about my big three, and that's education, economy, and environment. Education, economy, and environment. And looking at, uh, you know, the economy, just a, a living wage. Um, we have to look at that. If someone makes fifteen dollars an hour, you're gonna make about um, about thirty thousand a year, which is good, but it's still below the, <laughs> the median uh, income. But you know, you look at the expenses of housing and, and healthcare, um, and uh, we have to really tackle that. Um, but it shouldn't be a sacrifice. You know, with talking about healthcare, you shouldn't uh, have to decide whether or not do I pay my bills or do I get this this medical procedure or treatment or go to the hospital. We've got to do better here in our country, and we need someone who's going to stand uh, for the folks in our district and make our voices heard down here. Yeah, I've been to other countries. I've actually gone to Brazil for medical care as a medical tourist. And the uh, difference in procedure prices, it's about a third of what medical care and procedures are in the United States. So yeah, so yeah. There's, there's a problem there. <laughs> Hospitals, problem. In, instead of being run for profit, we need to be run for care. It's about yeah. <laughs> taking care of our folks. But, we're, but you know, we have, uh, um, you know, we see that with our own mission health, uh, you know, mission hospital system here. It's uh, that they're, they're making just astronomical profits off of illness and sickness. And it shouldn't be that way. We've in the most, you know, developed country on the planet, the best nation in the world. We need to do better. We have to do better for our for our people. Yeah. And I don't know how we get there, but I remember days whenever hospitals were not for profit. Right. I remember when day, days whenever like uh, St. Joseph, which was taken over by mission, maybe in the mid, mid or late nineties, that was a Catholic hospital. And, and I grew up where hospitals were not for profit. Yeah, it's, it's a shame. And uh, you know, when, when money rules the day, boy, watch out, you know, the love of money is the root of all evil. And we have to um, get back to putting people over politics and people over profit and yeah, take and care of our brothers. And there's much more to life than money. Money can't buy uh, things that quality of life should be about. Uh, yeah. Quality of life has is other issues that money has nothing to do with. Agreed. <laughs> so <laughs> so on the, on the uh, economy thing, the uh, infrastructure bill, which is still being debated in, uh, in uh, Congress, um, do you have any thoughts on what that would be about, what it would mean for the region? Well, you know, we, we all know how um, poorly our infrastructure is here, uh, has structured here in the mountains. Um, I was just at a, a, a home uh, over the weekend at one of the con our constituents here. Uh, and, you know, it's a lovely home in a lovely, I mean, just beautiful surround by mountains and trees. It's beautiful deer, you know, running everywhere, wild turkeys. Um, but she has a drive to Ingalls to get Wi-Fi, <laughs> right? Because she doesn't have high-speed internet at her house. And 43% of our homes, of the homes in our district, do not have high-speed internet or, you know, or, or reliable broadband. There's a quarter, 25% of the homes in our district can't even get internet, don't even have access to it. So we, we have to start there uh, because it's an education issue. Uh, right. Back during the pandemic, um, I led 463 students and about 80 staff through the pandemic and our teachers, that's why education is at the top of my list. And I'll, I'll stand on that mountain, stick, stake my flag, flag in the ground and defend it uh, till kingdom come. But, you know, our teachers had to had to relearn how to teach talking to a computer screen like we're doing now. You know, back before the pandemic, we'd be face to face in the studio. Um, I, I was a, a director of a, a radio station uh, down in St. Lucia. But that's I will talk about that another time. So I love radio. And once again, your name is fantastic for radio. Um, but we you know, our teachers are now teaching to a screen. There were kids, there were families that would have to drive into our parking lot because they didn't have broadband. They'd have to go to Starbucks or Ingles or McDonald's and sit in their cars in the parking lot just so their kids could learn. Now, what does that do to the parents or the guardians that are having to do that? Well, 
they now uh, can't work, <laughs> right? Because there's nowhere for the kids uh, to, to learn and, and to do that at home. Um, it's a healthcare issue. Um, you know, some of our vets and folks and, and elderly out in the, the rural parts of the district, telehealth has emerged as one of the leading uh, health care mm -hmm. avenues. But if you don't have high speed Internet or broadband, then you're going to have to drive an hour, hour and a half to have a procedure or to have a baby. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, and then you look at jobs and economy. You know, how can we compete on a global scale? on a global economy if I can't even tap into the World Wide Web, <laughs> you know, Why? so 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 it's uh, it's you know, and, and that's just just one of, you know, just one of the, the main issues that we have to tackle uh, for all those reasons. Well, you know, Eisenhower was able to get legislation passed for the Internet highway system by stressing that it was a defense issue. And in a way, I think that you can also use that kind of, you know, it's, it's imperative that people in any little hill and holler back in, back in, uh, uh, dismal, dismal holler, Virginia <laughs> or dismal holler, North Carolina can have access to the information superhighway. That's exactly right. Yeah, the internet system, uh, inter interstate system was set up by Eisenhower. And yeah, it is a, a, a national security issue. Yes. Um, and, uh, and and we have to make it a priority. You know, it's a yes. shame that uh, that uh, legislation can be held up by just one or two people. Right. Um, and, you know, we have to look at the greater good, um, you know, for, for the country. We have to uh, improve our in uh, infrastructure. You know, as you're riding down highways, you can see that how much work is needed. You know, just here at the Malfunction Junction on 26 is getting better, you know what I mean, just uh, with the improvements that they're doing. But that needs to go on, not just throughout our district, but throughout our state uh, and the country. And uh, we need to get that uh, passed for the for the betterment of our nation. Yeah, yeah. So um, the environment is something that you cover on your on your uh website mm -hmm. um what what do you have what's your points about this do you honestly think that all the floods we've been having here and and the overly hot summer is that is that a natural cycle or is that man-made is that <laughs> what's what what's the deal on that it's naturally man-made <laughs> well you know you know just with my uh uh just going through counseling and, and with, uh, you know, with folks who are uh, in addiction with addicts, the first thing mm -hmm. uh, you have to do uh, on your road to recovery is admit that you have a problem, admit that there is an issue. And in order for us, um, you know, as a nation to move forward on our road to recovery, we have to acknowledge and admit that there is an issue. You know, I lived uh, a number of years in the Caribbean and, uh, you know, going down there now, we're planning on going back to see my wife's family at Christmas, God willing, um, just seeing the erosion of the beaches because of the coral reefs that are that are being depleted, uh, how that uh, impacts the coastline uh, here in the east, all the flooding. See, the thing is, with the hurricanes every year, it's a new record. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. For the last decade, it's been a new record every year with Hurricane, the largest storm to hit landfall, uh, the most rainfall in certain areas in Greenland. They just recorded rain for the very first time in certain regions up there for the first time in recorded history. You know, we look on the, the West Coast and this, the extreme droughts and the wildfires that uh, that just kind of consume the West each and every year. Records are being broken. And so we have to look at taking care of the economy uh, or, or, or taking care of the environment. We have to, it's incumbent upon us. And what I was really encouraged by is back during the height of the pandemic, when there were no trains, planes, or automobiles, right? Nature rebounded. All of a sudden in Beijing, they could see the sky. In LA, the smog had lifted. Uh, you know, deer and, and wildlife starting to reclaim cities and they're seeing it in downtowns. And it's just like, it was phenomenal how quickly nature rebounded. Um, I would love to think that we could flip a switch and automatically we're back on track. We're zero carbon footprint, zero emissions. But I know that that's not going to happen right away. But we can start turning uh, that that ship uh, <laughs> um, to, to right the ship, so to speak. We can start now. And that'll come with uh, uh, green technologies. You know, I toured Meritor 
uh, a factory here uh, that's located in Fletcher, right here in the mm -hmm. district. They make 70% of the axles that go on the big rigs in this country. 70% of those axles come from Meritor. They had a, a, a room or a section uh, that was kind of partitioned off that they're dedicating to electric engines. And so, and that's the green technology that we're talking about. And they were saying within the next five to seven years, we're going to start to see an increase of these big rigs that have these electric engines on our highways. So that's going to help reduce the emissions in, in our carbon footprint. Uh, green technologies like vertical farming, um, you know, housing is an issue. And so as we build housing, well, it's going to take up some of our farmland. Well, how do we uh, decrease uh, in mass but increase production is through vertical farming. Mm -hmm. And we can retrofit some of these buildings and we can produce um, our food year round. So what's that going to do is going to create jobs, is going to help with our food deserts, uh, and it's going to create a product that we can now export from our region to the rest of the state as well as the country. And so we have to take climate change seriously. Um, you know, Steve Harvey is a, is a you know, famed comedian. He does the, uh, he's family feud guy now, but before his, um, his, uh, his show, either before or after show, he has like a little monologue and you can look this up on YouTube. The time he's talking about how awesome God's creation is and how awesome God is. And he says, if you don't believe me, how awesome God's creation is and how beautiful it is. He says, drive down I-40 through Asheville, North Carolina, and look at the Blue Ridge Mountains. Here's a man who's lived all, who's been all over the world. He chose our district. This is a desirable place to live. It's an, we have an awesome uh, communities. We have awesome uh, just people. Um, school systems are, are, are great. We still need some work to do on those, right? You know, but, but, but that, that's the whole point of me running for Congress is to turn an eye to that. You know, education is under attack now from, from the GOP. Uh, and we need to make sure that we defend and protect our most vulnerable and valuable asset and resources that our country has, which is our kids and our people. You just said that education is under attack from the GOP. Do you have any kind of inkling why education is such a target for the GOP. Well, that's, that's not on your, <laughs> that's not on your, uh, your issues list here, but you, you, you opened the door there. <laughs> <laughs> I did open the door. Well, um, just when we see uh, the rhetoric coming from our current congressman, um, where he, where he encouraged folks, take your kids out of public school and homeschool them. You know, take your kids out, pay a teacher $250 a week and homeschool them. It's like, well, wow, if we could pull our kids out and pay somebody $250 a week, oh, we'd all be in a better position, <laughs> you know. Um, and, and, and it's under attack, you know, uh, going around to different school boards and drumming up misinformation um, and just shouting it as loud as you can with no sort of background, no sort of backup, no sort of uh, data to, to back it up. Uh, and so, you know, I went to our school board uh, when the current congressman came and I said, uh, I said, listen, we don't need someone coming in here uh, telling us how to take care of our kids, uh, especially someone who's been absent for the last 18 months. Um, and I just thank the board, um, the school board and, and the, the, the superintendent and the leadership for making these tough decisions during this time. You know, we all want our kids back in. We, you know, we, no, no one wants to walk around masks on all the time, but if it's going to help us get back to normal so that we can reopen our jobs and get our kids, you know, back in school without the masks, um, then, then, then we're going to do it for now. Um, but, uh, you know, I thank them for basing their decisions off of fact and not fiction off of mm -hmm. data and not delusion mm -hmm. and basing it off of people and not politics. And so, um, you know, it's under attack, you know, they're, they're screaming and talking about CRT and, um, you know, uh, just, just overwhelming, just bombarding is, has been weaponized. Masks have been weaponized. Our schools have been weaponized. And so people are going into school board meetings and in, in Buncombe County, they, they, took over this, they sat in the chairs and said, we deposed the board. We're now the new board. And that that's eerily similar and familiar to what happened on January the 6th. And we, we refuse to allow that to happen here. So we're going to stand up. We're going to stand up and defend our kids and our education and our school boards. Yeah, we have to, we have no choice. Yeah. And they certainly have thrown out the gauntlet that this is the direction that we're going to take you. If you're a part of the Republican party, we're, 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 
we're weaponizing everything yeah. that is uh, maybe enlightening so people do not think that we are the be all end all to lead the country from uh, whatever decadence they think we've sunk into. Yeah, and, and, and what's encouraging as well, um, you know, for me, as, as I travel throughout the district, as I'm in grocery stores and, and, and restaurants and just out and about, um, folks, have have approached me, have approached my wife, just saying, Eric, listen, I'm I'm sick of all the division and and just the you know the divisiveness. Uh, we need somebody who's going to bring us together. Um, mm -hmm. And they said we're going to vote for you. I've had folks tell me I've been Republican all my life, but I'm switching to independent so that I can vote for you uh, in the primary. Um, and so they're fed up as well. They don't like the direction, uh, you know, of 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 where the GOP is is going and. Um, uh, they, they feel the frustration, uh, and and that's why I'm I'm running, you know, just to to be able to build those bridges and uh, reach across the aisle uh, and let folks know, hey, we're going to do this, we've got this, we're in this thing together. And like right. I said, that's part of our mountain values is looking out for your neighbor. Right. So back uh, briefly to climate change, and then I'll move <clears throat> on to your next issue. Okay. You say from investing in renewable energy to upgrading our infrastructure to become modern, resilient, and energy efficient, we have the opportunity to create millions of good paying American jobs along the way. Mm -hmm. Certainly, and, and that's what it's about. Our country is built, we're innovators. We overcome, we adapt. Uh, that's what we do, and we need to tap into that potential. That's why education is so very important. We have to, uh, universal pre-K is so very important. We have to start early with teaching our kids to be lifelong learners. Uh, and, and here's something that, that really surprised me is uh, I have a cousin of mine who works in, in, the, in the tech industry, and he's talking to me about, about, about things that don't even exist yet, <laughs> right? And I'm just like, wait a minute, what are you talking about? And he said, and we have to train our kids right. for jobs that don't exist yet. Think about before the cell phone came out. It was just a, a thought in somebody's head. And now you can't, you can't find anybody, dare I say, <laughs> any adult without a cell phone right now, right. which didn't exist, you know, a couple of decades ago, however long. And we have to start, we have to be innovative and forward thinking and train our kids to be lifelong learners, to ask those, those pertinent and, and penetrating questions. Well, what if, well, what about this? I asked a kid one time what they want to be when they grow up. And you know what this kid told me? And this, this blew my mind. <laughs> he says, I want to run a space circus. <laughs> and I said, I was like, what? What's a space circus? He said, you know, circus in space. And I said, well, that's fa that's phenomenal. Who would have, I never would have thought about that. And if and when that day comes, when there's a space circus, <laughs> you, heard, you heard it here first is one of my little kids that thought about that. So it's, it's awesome that they're inquisitive and they're thinking and we have to train them uh, or, or teach them to continue to be lifelong learners and to, and to, and to grow and, and don't try and hem them in, um, but, but let them uh, be free thinkers. Yeah, Steve Jobs said that, you know, it's, he felt like it was his job to create uh, devices and technology that people don't even know that they need at all. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, so let's move on to immigration. You say America is built on the values of freedom, democracy, and opportunity for all immigra immigrants lies in the heart of these values. Yet politicians continually use it to sow fear and incite resentment. And uh, this is also <clears throat> what was done in the Third Reich back in the 30s to create fear about the other. And so it troubles me deeply whenever I see the same kind of rhetoric going on again. <clears throat> yeah. And this is what authoritarian leaders do to keep the level of fear up in the, in uh, their constituents or their supporters. Yeah. Um, it, it, you know, talking about the border um, and, and immigration, you know, this country was built, uh, you know, on, uh, and on, on immigrants, you know, <laughs> uh, everybody, uh, you know, unless you're a native American, um, you're, you're an immigrant. 
Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, first and foremost, foremost, we need to we need to secure the border. I mean, that's no doubt about it. I think of my home here. Um, you know, I, I lock my door. I, I close it, you know, when I leave. Uh, but we we need to just, you know, be able to secure the border, be it um, fencing, a wall, uh, drone technology, you know, whatever the case is, it's got to be done humanely. Um, I think we need to um, back our uh, border patrol and, and make sure that, uh, um, you know, that they're properly trained and, and which which they are. I hadn't been to the border, um, but I do know uh, um, that folks need to treat people with dignity and respect and humanely. And there are asylum seekers. And I think we need to uh, increase uh, the amount of judges there to hear those cases. We need mm -hmm. to in increase advocates there that are experts in um, you know, in, in the law that can uh, help expedite that. And my own uh, story with immigration, my wife was born in, uh, in, born in Barbados. And uh, when we moved back here, uh, she has a master's degree uh, in international business and banking, um, you know, finish her degree in, in three years. And then her, you know, she, when, when, when I said I do, my IQ shot up, right? <laughs> she's, she's brilliant. I love her dearly. 25 years we've been married. Um, but when we came back uh, to the U.S., my brother had to sign as a guarantor for her in case something happened to me that she wouldn't become a ward of the state. And it took us a year and a half for her to get her green card, a year and a half for a master's degree holder from a, an American university at FIU, right? With three kids married at that time. We've been married for, um, oh, she's going to get me 12, 12 years, I think, <laughs> you know, and we're coming back and I'm like, what am I, chopped liver? I can provide for my wife, but you know it, we have to we have to bring it into the 21st century. I mean, it's it's uh, it's crazy how long it takes for that process to go uh, through. And I think also um, we need to, uh, you know, when I was teaching uh, uh, math in high school, I would bring kids in uh, like upperclassmen. I taught freshmen all day long, and I bring in upperclassmen to do kind of like peer tutoring to help them. You know, they, they're going to see it from a, a student's perspective, from a kid's perspective, and they can answer questions and and be a little better. Uh, you know, get the point across. You know, other than the teacher always telling them a peer, which they know and respect, can help them out. And I think maybe something like that, a, a, a training, a peer tutoring. Uh, um, sort of mechanism that we could have folks who have gone through the process who are uh, citizens or green card holders to go back and say, hey, this is what you need to know. This is what you need to do. This is how you need to do it. And this is who you need to talk to if you need health care, education, so on and so forth. And kind of use like a, a training or a mentoring or a peer tutoring uh, program for folks at the border. But it's definitely a, an issue that we have to uh, we have to take into consideration and look closely at, but treat people uh, humanely. So from your own experience then, and getting your wife uh, first a green card and then I'm assuming onto a citizenship, the, uh, the feeling that I hear from the anti-immigration people is these people are, are in our country and they're taking uh, advantage of uh, facilities and monies that I don't think is available to them, but they're using this as a way to say that they are here taking advantage. Yeah, once again, uh, it's, it's been weaponized, um, like, like a lot of things, <laughs> and it's, it's used as, a, as a, a dividing measure, you know, mm -hmm. just to drive a wedge between, uh, between folks. Um, you know, in, in our community. I mean, we look at our community here being uh, that we're agricultural, you know, we have a high agricultural sector. Um, it'd be really hard uh, for us to, uh, you know, produce the crops that we do with with apples and other vegetables um, without uh, migrant workers. It'd be it'd be extremely tough. Uh, and just talking to, to local farmers uh, in the area, um, you know, they need folks that, you know, are willing to do the work um, and there are jobs that are available. Um, but we need folks uh that can do the work. And, you know, part of that uh, gets back to getting this pandemic under control. Um, you know, when people talk about masks, you know, unmask my kids and the masks don't work. And, you know, I've, I've asked a few people, okay, if you've ever had a, a medical procedure done uh, and you walk into the operating room, does a surgeon have a mask on? Do the nurses have masks on? Okay, well, why do they have them on if the masks don't work? Of course, the masks work. Mm -hmm. um, the numbers are, are, are declining and going down. Why? 
because the masks work and the vaccine works. And so once again, these things have been weaponized um, to use to drive a wedge between uh, folks in the community. And uh, we have to we have to cease with the, the just the divisive rhetoric uh, and start looking for solutions and be solutions oriented. Yeah, to me, it's the most irresponsible thing I have ever witnessed in uh, in a leadership world that the pandemic has been weaponized and turned into a political issue. It's, yeah. uh, my husband's parents, my husband's father uh, lost two sets of parents in the Spanish flu fa- pandemic. He, he lost his natural parents and then he lost his adopted parents. And so he ended up in an orphanage in Chicago. And my husband will say that that situation that happened with him, it affected him the whole, the rest of his life. Yeah. And, and you, and you see people, um, you know, who have, uh, fortunately survived, um, you know, COVID and you, you know, they have a camera in front of them in the hospital or they get out and they say, you know what, take the vaccine, <laughs> right. It's not worth it. And you look at the strain that is putting on, uh, our, you know, the healthcare workers, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and people, for people to say, um, you know, to, to spread the misinformation about it. Um, and, and I understand it's people's right, you know, to get it or not to get it, uh, that that's, that's on you. Um, but think of your neighbor, think of your, um, you know, your, 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 your parents, your, your relatives, you know, I wear my mask uh, most times when I'm out, especially in, in crowded places, just because I think of my mom, you know, my mom is, uh, um, you know, she works with an elder care and I want to make sure I protect her and, you know, where social distance can't be, uh, you know, adhered to, um, but it's getting better. Um, and, and that's an encouraging part. It's getting better. The masks are working, the vaccines are working, and uh, we need to, you know, get back to some sort of normalcy to where we're now trying to find solutions as opposed to highlighting all the problems that we have. Yeah. So let's move on to the Second Amendment. Uh, You say every person has a right to defend themselves and pursue a tradition of hunting and sportsmanship that so many in the mountains of Western North Carolina grew up enjoying. Mm -hmm. You say, I myself am a licensed North Carolina gun owner. Mm -hmm. That said, weapons of war do not belong on American streets or in American classrooms. I believe in common sense guns laws that will uh, keep our communities safe. And I wonder, this is a burning question that I have. Okay. What must the consequences be of children growing up with a constant threat of a mass shooter in their midst? We, you didn't, know... <laughs> we didn't have that. We did, we'd had that. We did have duck and cover. <laughs> <laughs> right. But you, but you know, when we were in, when we were coming up in school, everyone remembers preparing for a tornado, doing a tornado drill. Yes. Well, you run out in the hall and you, you know, face the wall and, and duck and things like that, um, or fire drills, right. um, you know, to where you line up and you leave in an orderly fashion. Well, now we're doing active shooter drills. Um, we're being trained on those things. Um, and and it, it, it hurts my heart. Um, you know, we had a school right here in our district, the school where my wife teaches math at Hendersonville Middle last year had, an, had, a, had a shooting. And I was, uh, you know, in, in the car rider line and uh, you know, at Bruce Rise, they were just a, a few blocks away. And uh, I saw the, the the first responders heading, you know, kind of that direction. And I was thinking, oh, wow, it must have been a big accident, gas leak or something. And then my phone rang uh, and it was my wife. And she says, Eric, there was a shooting. And I all heard was, Eric, there was a shh. And I took off um, and I got in my car and I, and I went up to the middle school to where there were police and deputies. Our first responders are awesome. They are on spot. I mean, it was no doubt that, you know, things were under control and safe. Um, but for a while there, I was, I mean, my heart was just palpitating. I didn't know what was going on. And I was thinking, wow, this happened here in Hendersonville, North Carolina. Um, I couldn't, I, it just blew my mind. Um, so for folks to say, oh, that'll never happen here. It happened here. Um, and we just need to, we just need to look at gun safety. Um, you know, 80, uh, 80, uh, 93% of, uh, the voting public agrees that we need to have background checks and red flag laws and things like that. 89% of Republicans feel that same way, uh, as well. And we just need to be smart about it. You know, when you talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, gun safety, 
uh, and reducing gun violence, um, we need to look at where these are sourced from. Uh, you know, a lot of folks talk about the gun show loophole. Um, you know, I think you need to have a license to buy any firearm. That's just my personal opinion. You know, I, get, I had to get trained and go through the laws about getting a concealed license. Well, to walk in and buy an AR-15 or, or a shotgun, I think there needs to be some sort of training there as well or some sort of license, I should say. Um, but something that uh, folks don't talk about a lot are Internet sales. I was talking to a gun owner, a gun shop owner uh, out uh, out in the West. And he says, we need to talk about that um, because you can you can order any part off the Internet of, for any gun and you can assemble it and it's untraceable. And so mm -hmm. we need to, you know, somehow get a regulation, uh, some sort of regulation on Internet sales as well. But, um, yeah, we need to do something to curb, um, uh, you know, gun violence and, and look at gun safety. Well, it's another thing that has been weaponized. Yes, so, that's exactly right. That's so, exactly right. you know, my my. Uh, feeling is, and I've had a tragic gun accident in my own life where my son was accidentally killed by an uh, unsecured weapon. I'm sorry. Sorry to hear so, that. Um, and, and so I've had many years to think about this, and I think that liability insurance on each gun should would be a uh, something to consider yeah i mean i think uh you know there are a lot of things you know we need we should probably look at and consider and, that, and that's the first time i heard that and that's i think that's a good idea um you know we just uh we just need to be able to take care of our neighbor uh you know if if there's someone that uh that i know uh, you know owns a firearm and they may be struggling a little bit or they may be a little depressed or whatever the the, mm -hmm. the reasoning is i'm going to mm -hmm. check on them Mm -hmm. um, not to run in and kick the door in and take their gun, but just because I love them and I mm -hmm. care about them. I care about their family. Um, and compassion has got to reenter this uh, arena somehow at some point in time. Um, we've gotten to the point to where if we disagree on something, on anything, then we demonize the other folks. Mm -hmm. it, it, we have to get away from that mm -hmm. um, and know that uh, we need folks who are going to be cool, calm, collected, and uh, have good uh, presence of mind uh, in pressure situations when, when emotions are, are raging all around them, they have to be level headed and, and cool headed and know that um, that we have to look at and act for the greater good uh, of uh, of our constituency and of our communities. OK, so we're moving on to voting rights. The right to freely participate in our democracy is core to our shared values of freedom and democracy. Mm -hmm. Yet for too long, this right wasn't equally distributed amongst all Americans. I am poignantly aware of the fact that as an African-American, I, I would not have equal access to the ballot if it wasn't for the blood, sweat. You don't say blood, sweat. I, I'm, I'm adding blood here. Blood, sweat, and tears and the shoe leather of brave Americans before me. Yeah, yeah. Um, I believe election day should be a, a national holiday. <laughs> you know, that's that's one of the most important rights that we have as Americans um, is our right to vote. That's how our voices can be heard one vote at a time. Um, and, you know, we hear about uh, election fraud. And, um, you know, I was speaking to a lady uh, a few days ago and uh, and she said uh, uh, and, and, and it was a, a misdial. So I called someone who was, a, you know, registered Republican. She had the same name of, of, another, <laughs> of another lady. And so we were talking about it. She said the election was stolen. I said, ma'am, let's talk about that. I said, um, what you know, what evidence was produced? Well, it just was. So I know that, that it's, it's baseless, first of all. But I told mm -hmm. her, I said, ma'am, you realize that the, um, the former uh, president had appointed judges and they threw it out. They said there was nothing there. Every court that it lay before said there's absolutely nothing. I said in Texas, I believe it was Texas, 11 million something votes were recounted in what, 16 or 64. It was just a, a, a minute amount. Uh, I think in Arizona, they found more for Biden when they went back and looked at it. And so we're like, it's nothing. It, there was there was absolutely nothing there. And to continue uh, uh, with the big lie is a danger uh, to our democracy. 
it's a danger uh, to the right that we that we all have. Um, and, you know, someone asked me the other day, what do I feel is the greatest threat? you know, to, 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 to our country? Is it China? Is it Russia? Uh, you know, North Korea, Iran, who is it? And I said, before all that, the, the greatest threat is internal. Because if you can tear a country apart from the inside, the enemies need only to walk in and, and, and collect uh, what's left. And so um, we need to stop the rhetoric with uh, um, there will be bloodshed if if elections don't go our way uh it's uh it's 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 false it's fake if i lose then it was fixed if i win then it was right that's ridiculous and we and we have to stop with the dangerous rhetoric because it's continuing to drive a wedge between the american people and folks right here in our district and, and that need to be so just because we disagree with someone doesn't mean that we demonize them right and again it goes back to results of an election if you don't like it has been weaponized Yes, that's exactly right. They, they, they lost an election. Um, you know, President Trump, he lost <laughs> free and, and fair. He simply lost. Records were broken, uh, you know, with the most folks to ever vote in an election. And he lost. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. Um, and instead of conceding and saying, congratulate, like every other president in the history of our country has done, he says, nope, it was stolen and we need to do something about it. Don't let them take your democracy from you and folks acted on and we see that happen on january the 6th mm -hmm. um in which i you know it hurt my heart to see that but we we can and will heal our nation but we're going to start now with uh with the uh with the midterms coming up yeah and i uh was uh seeing this attack on the media back in 2014 and 2015 it, it's, it seems like it's been a systemic uh, effort on parts of uh, the extremists, mm -hmm. possibly on both sides of the extremists, to uh, uh, denigrate and uh, dismiss the importance of the media in our democracy. And, and if we also weaponize the fact that uh, the media is around and, and we're a watchdog for power, then, you know, it seems like all of the systems that we have in place are being attacked. And um, uh, it's incredibly similar to what was going on in the 1930s in Germany. Yeah, we, uh, you know, th th there's uh, one of my favorite uh, sayings or scriptures, in all thy getting, get an understanding. <laughs> right and and what's happened is is folks have taken what they see on the internet or one person's opinion and said oh that's it it's got to be mm -hmm. true and 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 that settles it as mm -hmm. opposed to just doing a little bit of digging and doing some research mm -hmm. yourself mm -hmm. uh, and it's well, important that we do that yeah and the problem with with the internet and i love the internet and i love technology obviously because i'm <laughs> very happy in my studio broadcast studio here <laughs> indeed but um uh, well, I lost my train of thought there and I had a really good point. Uh, so we've got about three more minutes mm. and I'd like for you to wrap up what you'd like to say to people who watch this and uh, listen to this on the radio and how to get in touch with you and how they can offer their support to you if they're so inclined. Oh, well, well, thank you, uh, Davine Dial. I love that name. Oh, you have a great, I'm telling you, great name for radio. Thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, and, you know, you hear folks say all the time mm -hmm. that I'm not a politician. And I echo that same sentiment. I'm not. I'm a public servant, uh, whether it's in school or church or helping our underserved communities or with law enforcement, I've called to serve. I'm fifth generation here in the mountains. My family is. Our roots, my roots run deep. I'm a son of this soil. Um, and I've watched politicians use this seat to launch uh, their own political careers um, with no regard for our communities here. Uh, and we're overdue for leadership that gives back. Um, we need to focus on our mountain values. And what I mean by that is no matter your politics, your skin color, your income, uh, where you live, who you call love, home, who you love, we love and respect our neighbors. We rely on each other. Your word uh, is your bond. Um, and a handshake is as good as a written contract. 
and we love our community and we love our country. That gets lost sometimes. We love our nation. This is the greatest nation on earth. But right now, uh, people can't even talk to each other in, in, in the community. And uh, we need to get back to that. My name is Eric Gash. Friends call me Big E and my big three, education, economy, environment. Go to my website at ericgash.com to follow on, to donate. Uh, but um, I'm going to be coming to see you soon. God bless you. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you, everyone, for watching and listening. Uh, this video of this interview will be available on uh, Facebook at WPVM's page. We'll share it with uh, Eric Gash for him to have on his website and anywhere in the social media world that he is in. I did remember the remark I was going to make. With the internet, everyone has a fog or has a bullhorn now. That's correct. That didn't happen in the past. And so <laughs> everybody's using their bullhorn out here. And Indeed. and some of it is is bull. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I might use that, David, if you don't yeah, mind. <laughs> go right ahead. That, that's bull. So thank you so much, Mr. Gash, for, for visiting with us. And uh, we're signing off now. This is WPVM. 1037 on your dial in Asheville, North Carolina, and globally at wpvmfm.org.